some years ago, I was doing linguistic field work in uh, Syria. And maybe you've had that experience yourselves, or maybe you heard about it from other people. But um, when we're abroad, it's actually easy to fall in love for some reason. So we fall in love with beautiful landscapes. And sometimes we also fall in love with people. And now, just to clarify, this happened long before I met my husband. <laughs> so when I was in Aleppo, I actually met someone who was, uh, he was the owner of the local student cafe, which unfortunately does not exist anymore. And this was a cafe uh, for intellectuals and uh, artists, religious and political figures. And he was a very charismatic individual. And I was attracted to him. And you know how when you're attracted to someone, you maybe not everyone, but certainly I worry about my parents, the clothes I'm wearing, my hair, <laughs> whether he likes my smile. Well, in this case, I didn't actually have to worry about these things because it so happened that he was blind. He could not see me. And so for the first time in my life, I actually worried about the sound of my voice and whether it was attractive. And ever since then, actually, like a lot of other researchers and a lot of people, I've been asking myself that question. What makes a voice attractive? Now, there's a lot of research showing that both for men and women, signals of reproductive potential are evaluated as attractive. So what does that mean? Well, for male speakers, it means that low voice low-pitched, low-pitched voice, which is associated with high levels of testosterone, is evaluated as attractive. For females, it's the other way around, because high-pitched voice appears to be a signal of fertility. Okay, so, so far, so good, and maybe you've heard this before. But what you may not know is that the voice that we're attracted to the most of all voices is our own voice. And how do we know that? Well, we know that, for, exa for example, from uh, a study entitled I Like My Voice Better, where they presented short vocal fragments to listeners. And among these fragments was unknowing to them also a fragment of their own voice. And you would think that you would recognize your own voice. You've heard it so many times. But of course, it resonates differently in your own head. So they didn't recognize it immediately, but they liked it. Actually, they liked it more than they liked the other voices. And they also liked it more than others liked their voice. Okay, maybe it's just because we tend to self-enhance ourselves. You know, we, in general, think of ourselves as being more attractive and more intelligent than others typically evaluate us. In general, right? But for me, as a behavioral researcher, what's interesting in this line of research is that they also found that our nervous system reacts to our own voice. And this you can measure. You can measure it, for instance, by means of galvanic skin response. That's the activity of your sweat glands. It's actually quite easy to measure. And what we know from these measurements is that our nervous system finds the sound of our voice arousing. Okay, so now you might be thinking, well, science doesn't really help the infatuated me from many years ago, because apparently, according to research, this guy just liked the sound of his own voice best, <laughs> so I didn't have to worry about what he thought of my voice. So is there at least something in this idea of us liking our own voice and reacting to it with attention, being drawn to it, is there something in it that we can use for an innovative idea. And I think so, and that's what my talk is about. So what's the explanation for why we are drawn to our own voice? As far as I'm concerned, the most likely explanation is the familiarity effect. Of course, it's the voice that we hear the most frequently, but now you're thinking, of course, we hear ourselves talking, but we hear it the most frequently also because it resembles our inner voice. So our inner voice, that's the voice in our own head that others don't hear, but that we do hear very often. Actually, it's been calculated, estimated, that about one-fourth of our conscious awake moments consists of this inner voice playing in our head. And in terms of brain activity, it actually resembles very much 
actual vocalizations. So it's not that different. It's just, it's just not something that others can hear. And what do we use this voice for? Well, actually, it's really, really important for us. It's something that makes us aware of our own existence, of who we are. And it's something that helps us monitor our cognitive performance. We use it to estimate whether we're achieving our goals, whether we're doing well enough, whether we're attending to what we want to attend to, whether we're focusing. It helps us create verbal memories. In short, it helps us function cognitively in the world. And now I think that this fact, together with the idea that our own voice, the sound of our own voice, actually draws our attention, can be used in uh, technological applications. And before I tell you something about that, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our research. In uh, my research, I look at the effect of sound on cognitive performance, particularly selective attention. And what we do is we use experimental tasks, like this one, which is an established paradigm. It's called a dichotic listening task, and it's a task where listeners are presented with uh, stimuli in their left and their right ear. And they are asked to make a decision. For instance, in this case, they are asked to decide whether what they hear, a digit, is higher or lower than five. So when they hear the stimulus, like this one, it's probably not that difficult. Eight, five, three, four. It actually doesn't matter whether they hear a male voice or a female voice in their other ear if they hear it right after one another. Six, seven, eight, nine. But what we actually do to our participants is that we present these stimuli to them simultaneously. And we tell them, okay, now you're asked to attend either to the male or the female voice. Eight, Eight, three, three, six, 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 eight. eight. This is actually really difficult and it's also quite tiring. It's somehow maybe comparable to a cocktail party or maybe to a Saturday morning in a big family or an Italian marriage. <laughs> so what's happening is that there is a lot of auditory input and we ask our participants to attend to just a part of that input. So we ask them to focus their attention. Now, let's combine this idea with the idea of our own voice being the input, the type of input that we react the best to and also the fastest to, and use that for technological innovations. Imagine an old lady driving in a car. Due to her age, her cognitive performance will be worse than the cognitive performance of a younger adult. And repeatedly, research has shown that cognitive performance is linked to driving performance. This is because her ability to attend to the task at hand, that is, to select, to draw her attention to the driving activity, will be disrupted by all kinds of distractors, like her own thoughts, her mind wandering. This unfortunately means that the chance that she will be involved in a car crash increases. Luckily, we have state-of-the-art technology, technology that's already widely av available, technology that comes from the field of social and effective computing, that can help us detect that such a mind-wandering episode is taking place. We have technology, we have smart sensors that can help us detect that the old lady is not paying attention to the driving. And the most um, likely sensor that we would use in this situation might be eye tracking. We have done experiments and others have run experiments where we've seen that people who are mind wandering exhibit different type of eye activity, different types of eye movements than people who are paying attention. And you can measure this by means of calculating dwelling time, fixations, uh, number of seconds. But we have other uh, types of sensors that we could use to enrich this information or to generate another type of information related to the cognitive performance of the old lady we can uh, automatically analyze her facial expressions. If she's talking to a fellow passenger, we might uh, analyze her vocal output. We could even, in real time, 
analyze her linguistic output, so the words that she's saying. With sensors monitoring her psychophysiological metrics, we could measure her heartbeat or we could measure her skin uh, conductance, so again, the activity of um, sweat glands. And if she would be moving, maybe sh if she would be on a bike or if we would be focusing on her movements, the movements of her arms, we could also uh, collect information about her body movements and evaluate it. All these smart sensors will give us information that might help us detect a, a sign or signs of cognitive conflict, the fact that she's actually not performing cognitively as she's supposed to in that situation. And this is a situation where typically we would be using our inner voice to correct ourselves. But we don't always do that. So to sum up, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to combine two complex observations here. One, an observation that comes from studies on human voice that tells us that we react, that we're drawn to the sound of our voice. And on the other hand, observations from the, uh, from the area of uh, social and effective computing and the technology that's available there that can help us monitor someone's cognitive performance. And what I'm suggesting is literally synthesizing these two observations, these two ideas, and to create applications where the output of smart sensors would serve as input to text-to-speech synthesis system that can synthesize our own voice. And these systems actually exist. They're mainly sold to people who, for some reason, uh, expect that they won't be able to speak in the coming future. But we might use them for these applications as well. And in that way, we would actually be able to hack the inner voice, the inner voice that helps us normally monitor our cognitive performance, but that's not always functioning properly, for instance, in older age or in particular situations. Now, if we have a system like that, then uh, we might not just contribute to uh, a higher uh, traffic safety, but we might even increase the emotional safety of a traveler in faraway regions. For instance, when the smart sensors would detect an increased heartbeat, and the vocal sensors would detect signals of trying to project reproductive potential in the voice. They might be the voice of the user in her headphones that would be telling her, get back to work, or rather with the current state of text-to-speech synthesis, get back to work. Thank you. <laughs>